people are awesome to come <laughs> this early. Thanks to the Ouija for the time slot, but whatever, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so you, how many people know Umbra in the, in the, how many people know Apple? Almost the same number, it's amazing. <laughs> Brand recognition is everything. <laughs> So uh, when they asked me to talk uh, uh, about how Umbra evolved with digital, it would be it was an interesting thing. So you know, you start thinking about what you're going to say, what's the topic, like how you're going to approach it, and then you start thinking about the application of digital to your business and your career and so forth. And you know, you realize today that everything is digital. Like, if, if I don't understand why there's so few people in this conference, because like the whole world is digital. We're talking about digital here, and yet there's just a few, I don't know, followers, diehards, or early adopters. Unless you lived on a mountain in Nepal, you're you're probably uh, digitally connected to something. Anyways, when it comes to manufacturing and making product like Umbra does, the first, I would say, 10 years before we had really computers, uh, you know, we had some operational computers, I guess, to run our business, but we didn't have any digital uh, devices to do design. And then, you know, as gradually as we started to uh, develop more products, uh, we were relying heavily on engineers. There's a few engineers in the group, right? Because the only, the computer power and the knowledge necessary to be able to do digital, uh, you know, create 3D data sets was very complicated. So we had to just do sketches or whatever and then turn it over to engineers who turned it into manufacturing models. And there was uh, computer numerically controlled uh, equipment at tool makers around the world to be able to make products. So the, the business of digital was already kind of in place in terms of manufacturing. You know, it was led by the car industry. Who could afford it? The first uh, SolidWorks programs that we started using were only run on supercomputers. And you had to spend $250,000 for one of these big boxes and then go to a specialized engineering house to get it done. And then when, <clears throat> when the... Um, software by s that SOLIDWORKS develops, developed would, could be able to run on a PC or a, a laptop or something. That changed everything because all of a sudden you could start running your own 3D data sets and that, that was an amazing change. So anyways, I'm one of these people that have gone from analog to digital but without being too disrupted. Like a lot of people complain about the disruptive forces of, working on us today. Uh, but it's actually, disruption actually helped us because uh, we were able to be way more productive. For me, I think what I found when I looked at some of the examples that I'm gonna show you, uh, it just made us more productive. And, um, and it, it's actually made us more creative. And it's also been a kind of two-way street between being, in, led by technology and technology, uh, t technology influencing us and us being informed by technology. It's an interesting balance because as you'll see some examples here, you'll, you'll find that we're highly influenced by the software. Uh, I think it was uh, Josephson yesterday talked about like, don't get led by your software, but like, that's almost impossible because the software is what you use to kind of express yourself. So it's an interesting time we're in right now where we're actually, uh, you know, working between analog or digital and digital. So then I started thinking about analog and digital. It really made sense to talk about both at the same time because there's a lot of people in the room that are just concerned about digital, but there's a big world out there that's also analog. And our, in our business where we play, uh, the world is still primarily, for example, bricks and mortar. So a lot of people are, startups in the room here today are talking about, you know, launching their products on Kickstarter. So they don't really, aren't that concerned about bricks and mortar, but bricks and mortar is still more than 90% of all retail. So if you're going to start an idea without considering bricks and mortar, it's kind of, 
a wasted opportunity in some ways. And also, you can't really redesign or reframe your business if you don't start thinking about the analog side of, of how you're going to be selling it or producing it, right? So there's, uh, there's a bunch of business stuff in here and just some advice to you guys about how you're developing our data, not to be sort of so stuck just on digital, but digital and analog is a kind of a nice balance. I mean, uh, you know, here's the areas where we play. This is a container store, and they're actually a really good, great retailer in the US. They're one of our best customers. But you can see here that everything's really well organized on the shelf, and um, we can see some of our products in the background there. Anyways, for the designers to be well informed, they have to be able to visit these kind of stores and be in a physical space <coughs> to actually see these type of products on display. And also they have this, they can see who we're aligned with in terms of other companies. So this is a physical space where you can actually go. I'm talking about a store, by the way. It sounds like it's some alien thing because you guys probably all buy online, right? But anyways, this is a store. <laughs> Okay, I can just imagine a few years from now where we don't even know what a store is. Okay, so this, these were stores and people actually walked there and bought things. Anyways, so, but for now, and who knows, you know, like there was a rumor that Amazon was going to start opening stores, right? So, there you go. So, we expect our designers to be able to be fully informed and go to stores like this to really know who our competitors are. But not just that, it's about how these physical products that we're going to make are going to be on display, what the packaging is and so forth. If you're just in a digital media, you don't really need to care about packaging. But we do because we have to be communicative in a physical space like this without any sales help and so forth. But of course, um, our designers, and I really, I just checked, you know, the last couple of weeks, I looked over everybody's shoulder at the studio and half the time they were on Pinterest. It's an amazing influence. I mean, so they don't really think they have to walk in the stores anymore because this is like a virtual store and they can have it even all categorized and flip, you know, from design, kitchen. These are the kind of things that they were looking at um, at the time. So how productive can you be if you don't have to fly to, you know, Dallas to the container store versus like flipping it up on your computer and seeing everything that you possibly could see in a particular category. So our designers now are becoming category experts. So after a year or two of working in Umbra, if I talk to a designer that's been working, for example, in a kitchen category, they pretty well know every single consumer product that's available today and also the price points. So this is how we, <clears throat> we are methodical about our business and pragmatic about producing product. It's not just an intuitive thing. It's about having all these research tools available for us. You know, there's still, the most important thing is this one-on-one -on -one contact, which is so wonderful that you guys are actually here. But who knows, like in the future, I guess we might be just watching this as a webcast because you won't be able to get around the traffic so horrible out there or maybe the water is going to rise up or whatever. Yeah, they might have to have <laughs> walkways like in, in Venice, you know, <laughs> in this building <laughs> when the lake goes up. But anyways... Uh, so one on one, that's Matt Carr, our uh, our VP of design, you know, discussing uh, or at least faking to discuss some product design for this photograph. But we, you know, we use a lot of Skype for you know reaching out to people worldwide. So you can be totally international from our office in Toronto, and we have you know offices in Sao Paulo, Amsterdam. Um, we have a design development comp uh, firm in um, our own team in Shenzhen, China. So we can be completely connected worldwide all the time with the digital technology. You know, the thing is though that the designers here, this is um, someone working on um, a vessel or a pitcher or something. I noticed that she was actually doing actually pen sketches with this thing, so like, wow. They're still doing a lot of analog work to develop ideas. So it does, I think, inform the design when they're actually making this brain to hand contact of this physical kind of thing that they're doing rather than just using vectors to create things. So it is, I think, an important thing that we always keep that in mind that we can actually need to actually teach sketching in school rather than just using tablets, for example, to do. And you know, this, this type of thing informs our, our design in the end. You know, of course, we do have, as I mentioned, SolidWorks. This is Laura working on one of her projects. 
So everything, every single thing, even though they start off in sketch form, is going to uh, be developed in a 3D data set. This is an amazing thing that a 3D data set is like part of our equity, really, of our business, where in the past, your designs might have been just in a drawer somewhere. This is an amazing sort of value for us that we can actually manipulate this. We have a data set we can send anywhere in the world, and we can do all kinds of things with it. For example, here is how um, they would build, uh, this is the skinny can uh, video of how it's built on SOLIDWORKS. So it's kind of fun the way, you can see that actually the software is informing the design because if, I'd love to play it again, but we don't have time. But they, the way they stretch all the lines and everything, it just creates the form that we were looking for, but also at the same time it fits what we wanted. So there's a nice combination of software and, and design expertise used in this thing. But it's, just, it's certainly really informing the design that they're using this kind of software to develop it. This is the kind of, Im I wanted to put this image up because I thought at a Digifest conference you'd probably get lynched showing something like this because like, what? Someone's actually doing something by hand. But we actually, um, we have a shop, a real physical workshop, and you know, people are out there carving out of styrofoam and all kinds of old kind of ways to be able to be, that informs their design uh, in a different way if you're doing it by hand, which is kind of, uh, is a very valid way of, uh, you know, thinking about um, how you address things that fit the human form, which is not necessarily pulled by all those vectors and so forth. It's a more organic kind of idea which can be accomplished here. You know, of course, we're using 3D printers like everybody else. I love 3D printing, and we've, you know, the first ones that we started looking at, we couldn't afford, only automotive could afford, which were like $250,000. Now they're really, really expensive, inexpensive, as you know. So we have like three of these. We have two in the office in Scarborough, but we also have one in Shenzhen. What's fun about that is that we can actually simultaneously print in uh, halfway around the globe, and then people can actually be talking about this object. It's almost like it's teletransported uh, from one end of the globe to another when you print simultaneously. It's an amazing idea. Uh, that we utilize every day. It's a workhorse for us. And for us, it's not about, uh, you know, a lot of people talking about 3D printing as for production. We're not really there yet. Some categories are. But for us, it's about proof of concept. So we have a 3D data set that we've created with, uh, in SOLIDWORKS, and now we're actually printing um, this to validate the design because we don't trust the data only on a screen as being a proper way of uh, proving out the data. So we need to see it in 3D. Plus we share this with a, a lot of people, right? We share it with our customers, we share it with our staff. Um, one thing that's interesting about the change of what an industrial designer does today versus what they did in the past and their real role in engineering is that and They've taken over the engineering function, which is really interesting, but also they've also become our kind of marketers because the image on the right was done in Keyshot um, as a rendering, and the image on the left uh, is the actual product. So, like, you can't even see the difference. So we can share these images uh, well in advance of going into production. That minimizes our risk by sharing with customers. And also we can share it internally uh, everybody has a really good understanding, a kind of shared belief of what this idea is, even before we do go even close to production. And then because it's, it's 3D data, the data can be pulled and changed in a lot of different ways before we actually go into production. Here's another example about, these are finials that we do for drapery rods, so you can't really see the difference between the actual and the virtual. I mean, it's amazing. So we really get a good idea of what we're doing using uh, digital technology. I'm, I like to play this too. The, the, the 3D data set can actually be used in really creative ways. This was uh, Lauren Thomas's um, student competition submission um, of, a, of a product she called Barbelly. And she used this software called Modo. Some of you probably know it uh, for animation. So it, it, now you see that it's allowing us to to use the data set in really creative ways other than just making product. So you can see this here, what she did. It's uh, pretty spectacular.
So every single thing that we do is a 3D data set. So we can actually take that data and with a Moto type of program, we can start creating uh, animations that are pretty uh, fantastic, like a Pixar kind of thing. And you know, the funny thing is that, you know, with uh, the culture today, when you look at something like this, you know, in the past you might have been really surprised by it or not believed that it was really real. But now after all the, you know, Pixar movies and so forth, you look at this kind of thing and you, you think, yeah, this is a real kind of enhanced, beautiful thing, right? Anyways, Lauren's a fantastic, uh, she just did this as an experiment. She self-taught herself moto. Now she's teaching it at Humber. But uh, she's an awesome lady. Did you like that video? Pretty interesting, right? To just to, to work from the data set. Um, so, uh, so now you can see that there's a much stronger connection between di the digital assets uh, for product design behind the scenes than you could imagine. Like when you walk through a store or look at product uh, online, there's a lot of uh, interesting things going on that how does this stuff get there? I think that's the question. And there's, it's f just packed with digital stuff to get things to market. Like even this is an organization tool, like a management tool that we have for all our data assets. So you can see there's a little picture there. That's a soap pump in the corner. But in that document, it's called, the, the, the program's called Flex. So everything is in that document with including digital assets, packaging, even all the correspondence between the designers, costing, it links to our, our ERP system. So we have a, uh, this is a way of a library system for keeping track of all your work. And it holds all of it in it, or links to it. So we use a digital program just to manage all our assets, right? We still have, the need for a bricks and mortar store. So we have one store in Toronto. Some of you have been there, I think. We had a party there for DigiFest a couple nights ago, so it's still fun. I mean, having a digital of a, a bricks and mortar presence was kind of important for us because we could actually see the stuff that we're doing virtually in a physical space and experiment with the displays, the packaging, and it's a brand building kind of idea. At the same time, we have our own website that we ship um, direct to consumer. So we are experience, um, you know, online sales uh, in a kind of small way, small percentage. But all our customers that are doing online sales all have significant increases every year, whereas bricks and mortar is kind of in decline. So that's an interesting thing. You guys are heading in that direction where you are going to be maybe reducing a lot of bricks and mortar retail space, which is kind of scary because what are you going to do with all that space out there? Maybe you're going to have to do some new kind of digital entrepreneurship because, I don't know, maybe they're gonna be parking spots, but maybe not. Maybe there'll be less cars. But there's definitely gonna be a reduction in the number of retail stores that you see. You're already sort of smelling it, you know. These are just a few pieces that were done. Uh, they're significant. Karamashi did this. He did this on a napkin, so quite analog. But then it was from there, the whole team took it completely digital. And Matt um, did this digitally, but also I like this example because he challenged the manufacturing method. If you look at any mailbox, like any, when you go home, home and look at them, they're always rectilinear based on folding metal in, in rectangles and, and a break at 90 degree angles. So what he created this form digitally, which was supposed to mimic a pop icon like an envelope, he force the technology to actually do complex curves bending metal and then in the end you get this incredible idea that's so distinctive that you know if you go to a street in downtown Toronto a suburb you'll see like one mailbox like this then a few door now you'll see another one because people really like the look of it so the whole street will end up with the same mailbox kind of fun and I like this idea as an example of a digital kind of doll like Alan Wisniewski, one of our designers, decided to do this little object, and it turned out to be a big hit, but everything was done completely digitally, and I always thought of it like, oh, you know, dolls have always been around, have been around, they found them in caves, you know, that have done millions of years ago, in straw and so forth. This is a completely r digitally rendered version, you know, androgynous, featureless, but people respond to it completely because it's part of our culture that we've adopted this kind of digital outlook on, on form. 
Uh, this, of course, is, uh, is um, totally digitally produced, and also it has uh, pump and mechanics inside it as a, as a soap pump that has a sensor in it. This one's really ironic because Steve Copeland's an excellent designer. He completely produced this idea of a portable ping pong set digitally, but the reason he did it is because he was fed up with his kids playing digital games all day long. So he said to them, so he built this thing so he can put it on his dining room table so he could play ping pong with them, an analog game, and he produced it digitally. So it's kind of an interesting irony to that. I just wanted to put this uh, up for you. This is the last couple slides. Um, I, I like the idea of producing digitally, actually making product digitally, but it's not really there yet. But I discovered in when I was in Columbia, uh, an engineer that had bought a robotic arm. And um, I think we have a video for this, do we? Yeah. So this is how it, it's a robotic arm with an extruder attached to it. So it's co computer numerically controlled. So it can actually build a room. It's big enough to build a room with striation type printing. And you'll see here how it works in the video. Um, so I thought, I was challenged by this because I thought, um, what's the application for, this is not proof of concept stuff. This is something that you really want to build. So there's the uh, robot arm and there's how he builds it. Now these were the first attempts at building furniture using striation printing, so he can actually, well, he's printed um, a series of furniture. It takes a couple hours to print each one, but it's um, instantly uh, available and uh, customizable and so forth. And, and so I looked at it and thought, well, it's still kind of heavy. Striation is still kind of really analog-based when you think about it, like building it with spaghetti over and over again. So I challenged a school down there called um, Agafeet to think differently about how to print uh, using this kind of um, technology for a real product for Umbra. And so these are one of my first sketches, how we could materially optimize the, the instead of building layers and layers of heavy plastic, why don't we actually just get it to connect? So now all of a sudden there's half the number amount of material there. And so we had a uh, 16, uh, our uh, sessions with the school when I was living in uh, Medellin uh, with them, and this is what they came up with. So um, smart. So the idea was do something that cannot be made using conventional manufacturing, but also still be relevant to a popular idea and also priced right. So this robot can actually print this clock, like in this kind of spaghetti mandala shape, um, and, a, and big. We could print this clock as big as a house because of the, the robot arm, right? Just a question of, of changing of the, um, the parameters. And these uh, women like the idea of printing these sort of animal silhouettes. So they're printing them with, um, with the, you know, the horns bending out so you can use them as sort of a child's uh, hook system. So this is gonna be quite large too, you know, up to a meter high. So it may be something that you wouldn't normally produce in conventional manufacturing. And this is a stool, it's like a thimble-shaped stool that will be molded over, printed over a preform. So we're going to put like a wood-type preform inside the equipment and then extrude the spaghetti-type plastic over top of it in these various forms that will form a structural kind of base for, for this design. So I think this is kind of breakthrough stuff. And... Um, it's the beginning. We're, I'm sort of reaching out to the world right now, and so is this company called Greenprint, if you want to know who they are. Greenprint, uh, Medellin. Um, we're looking for ideas on how to really do something with this technology to sort of boost regional manufacturing in that area, which is kind of fun for me. So thanks for listening. Here's my uh, email address if anyone wants to get in touch with me, paulrnumber.com, and you can follow me on Instagram. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed the lecture.